we covered flexible volumes in an earlier lesson. In this lesson, we're going to cover infinite volumes. So let's recap flexible volumes first. Flex balls are always contained in one aggregate. And aggregates and their disks are always owned by a single node. So, because of this, flex walls cannot span aggregates or nodes. They're always contained in a single aggregate. The maximum size of aggregates and flex walls is controller dependent. For example, on a FAS 8080EX, which is currently the largest model, the maximum aggregate size is 400 terabytes and the maximum flex wall size is 100 terabytes. So, with flex walls, the biggest size we can go to now is 100 terabytes. That's where infinite volumes come in. Infinite volumes allow us to have volumes which are a larger size. Infinite volumes, where they differ from flexible volumes, is that they can span multiple aggregates and nodes. An infinite volume is a single scalable volume that can store up to 2 billion files and up to 20 petabytes of data. So it can grow much larger than a flexible volume can. With infinite volumes, clients see a single junction path and namespace for the entire volume. So what this is designed for is workloads that require a single huge flat namespace. The logical size of the infinite volume can be larger than the available physical size by using thin provisioning and they can be expanded non-disruptively. An infinite volume is placed in its own dedicated SVM. Infinite volumes support NAS protocols only, so SAN is not supported. You can have flexible SVMs and infinite volume SVMs on the same cluster and they can share aggregates. Now, typically you would have dedicated aggregates for your infinite volumes, but you don't have to. You can have both flexvols and infinite volumes using the same aggregates. You should not create SVMs with infinite volume if the cluster contains SVMs with SAN configuration. In that case, it would be recommended to use separate clusters. And SVMs with infinite volume span between 2 and 10 nodes. The way that it works, the infinite volumes are made up of constituents. We have data constituents, a namespace constituent, and namespace mirror constituents. We'll cover what they do in the next few slides. So each infinite volume has a single namespace constituent that maps directory information and file names to the file's physical data location within the infinite volume. So the namespace constituent, it is in control of finding what aggregate the file is on that a client wants to access. The data is stored in data constituents. There will typically be multiple data constituents spread over multiple nodes. A namespace mirror constituent is an intracluster data protection mirror copy of the namespace constituent. So intracluster meaning it's within the same cluster. The namespace mirror provides a backup copy of the namespace constituent because we need the namespace constituent to be able to find files. If we only had a single copy, that would be a single point of failure. We don't want that, so we have the namespace mirror constituent as a backup of it. Your clients are not aware of constituents. These are transparent to your clients. The clients interact with infinite volume as if it was a single normal directory on a single storage system. So let's look at how our constituents work. Here we've got a client and it sends in a read request for a file that is in the infinite volume. The read request will go to the namespace constituent, which is in charge of finding on what aggregate that file is. It will see the particular data constituent that the file was on, and it will be served to the client from there. You can specify the aggregates you want to use and the size of the infinite volume when you create it. New data constituents of an infinite volume are balanced equally across nodes, meaning all of the data constituents in an infinite volume are all going to be the same size. This means that the node with the smallest available space determines how much space is used on each node and limits the size of an infinite volume that you can create or expand. For example, if you tried to create a 6 petabyte, 6 node infinite volume, 
but one of the nodes used by the infinite volume only had half a petabyte of available space, then each node can hold only half a petabyte of data constituents. It's limited to the smallest one. And that would limit the total size of the infinite volume in this example to approximately three petabytes. Okay, so that was the main information about infinite volumes. They also support an optional feature called storage classes. These allow you to provide multiple tiers of storage that is transparent to clients. And when I say multiple tiers, I mean that we could have aggregates that are made up of SATA drives and other aggregates that are made up of SAS drives, for example, in the same infinite volume. We could put our important data onto the SAS drives and our less important data onto our SATA drives. With this being transparent to our clients who see the infinite volume as being a single flat namespace. So you can use this to optimize your storage by grouping it into storage classes that correspond to specific goals. All data is written to that single file system by the clients and then a data policy that you've configured automatically filters data for the files into different storage classes. Incoming files will be placed into the appropriate storage class according to the rules that you configure based on file name, file path, or the file owner. You can define the following characteristics for a storage class, the aggregate characteristics, such as the type of disks to use, and volume settings, such as whether thin provisioning, compression, and deduplication will be enabled. Now, you can't configure storage classes with the normal command line and system manager GUI. You have to use the on-command workflow automation and on-command unified manager packages, which are separate optional software packages that you can use for managing NetApp systems. So let's have a look at an example of using storage classes. Here, we've got a four node cluster. The namespace goes on an aggregate on node 1, and the namespace mirror has been placed on an aggregate on controller 3. We have six aggregates made up of SAS drives, which are spread over nodes 1, 2, and 3. We're going to use these as the gold storage class. And we've got six aggregates which are made up of SATA drives, which are also spread over nodes 1, 2, and 3. These will make up the silver storage class. Notice that we weren't using node 4 for our infinite volume. We've got a separate SVM made up of flexvol volumes, which is using nodes 2 and 4. We configure our data policy for our storage classes in the infinite volume. And a client sends in a PDF, for example. We've configured our data policy that that will be written to our SAS drives to the gold storage class. And then an AVI file comes in, we've configured our data policy that this will be written to the silver class.